Good morning. Welcome to Christian Outreach Fellowship. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you. We praise you for this day. As always, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together and to gather together as your people in this place today, Lord. We ask, Father, that you would clear our hearts and our minds now, uh, things that have gone on this weekend, Father, up until this point, Lord, that this time may be set aside, especially for you, God, just to honor you and to worship you, Father, and to serve you this morning. We ask, Father, you would bless those who are on their way. They will arrive ready to worship you and to hear your word today, Lord. And Lord, as we worship you now through song, we ask that you would be lifted up and glorified today in this place, Father. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. say thank you enough Lord just for your goodness in our lives and your mercy in our lives hallelujah praise your name thank you Lord praise your name Jesus 
We just thank you, Father, for your mercy.
We just can't say thank you enough, Lord, for all that you do for us, God, and how you saved us, God. Most importantly, Lord, we thank you for that gift of salvation, Lord, the ultimate sacrifice, Lord, that was paid on our behalf, God. And Lord, now as we continue with the rest of our service, Lord, we ask that you would just um, speak to our hearts, Lord, open our hearts today, God, that we may receive your word. Open our eyes, Lord, that we may see you in the scriptures today. Lord, as our pastor brings forth your word today, we ask that you would bless him and encourage him even as he encourages us today through your word, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, good morning. At this time we will have our announcements. If you all could follow along in your bulletins. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it, run to it and are saved. Proverbs 18.10. And the word for today. Now these were more noble minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. That's in Acts 17, 11. Bible study. Wednesday night Bible study will be held August the 28th at the Sheffield Community Center. We encourage you to read ahead 1 Corinthians and allow the Lord to speak to you as you prepare your heart for next week's message. Resource table. The resource table is filled with many Christian books, magazines, pamphlets, tracks, music, movies, and other resources to help you to understand God's word and to grow in the grace and knowledge of who he is. All resources are available for free or to sign out for your usage. Please stop by after service today. Free copies of COF services. Audio recordings of COF services are available upon request. To request copies of any Sunday service, please sign up at the resource table. Also, all messages will be posted to YouTube. Type in Sunday Church Service COF, and that should take you right there to our services. Opportunities to serve here at Christian Outreach Fellowship, there are many opportunities to serve. If you would like to serve in any ministry here and can be faithfully committed, your gifts and talents are welcomed and needed. To request more information regarding any ministry, please see Pastor Jones after service or sign up at the resource table. As each has received a gift, Use it to serve one another. First Peter 4.10 for, for the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. All these men understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. First Chronicles 12.32 So with that, we would like for everyone to stand and greet each other. Amen.
Even thought you knew that, bro It's the training for heat to go and reach Move back home, yeah Come on, y'all
want to say that the Lord gives us an opportunity to give. Giving is a, it's an excellent time to practice sowing and reaping, which we're going to talk about today. He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. So God gives us the opportunity to be blessed by him. This is one of the avenues that God uses to bless us. And I just want to say, too, regarding giving, that giving is a, an, is a, a treat. Y'all feel me on this? This, this isn't something we just do because we, you know, we uh, are forced to. Remember we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, don't do it because you feel obligated, because you're forced to, but do it out of a love for God. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Are y'all with me on this thing? Not because you've been forced, because they passed the plate around. We don't do that around here. Okay? But it's just, to, just so that you know, we have a box here, and this box, just like in the Old Testament, they set up a box. I think it's in Josiah's day. They set up a box where people could give, and, and this is what we're doing, okay? And uh, I pray that you would give and give God that opportunity to bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, lift his countenance towards you and give you peace. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give today. We pray that it will go long, a long way towards building your kingdom. Also, that it would teach us the principles of giving. Help us to know that if we're not faithful with unrighteous man, and how shall you trust us with the true riches of the kingdom? Help us to realize, Father, that giving is an opportunity. It is a chance for you to bless us and to give us a chance to build up your kingdom. We thank you for this opportunity. Be honored in all that's said and done, because you are our Lord, you are our King, you are our Master. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We have a song today, and um, the name of it is Be Healed. I believe it's Canton Jones. And, you know, there, there's so many diseases out here, right? You know, there's, there's, um, there's cancer, there's glaucoma, there's uh, kidney disease, there's all types of diseases. We're told in, first, in, in uh, Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, God told his people, if you obey me, I will not put any of the sicknesses that I put upon the Egyptians. And I just want to say that, you know, God is a healer, all right? It doesn't mean that we don't get sick. We live in a fallen world. But we run to Jehovah Rapha, our healer. So he is the one who heals us. He's the one who makes it so that you and I um, physically will be okay. Advil never healed anyone. Tylenol never healed anyone. It was always Jesus in his mercy. It was always God. So I just want to remind you all that we run to him for our healing. We run to him for our, 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 our physical healing. Remember we talked about in him before Asa, how that Asa sought not God, but he sought the physicians, and he died when he was diseased in his feet. So let's just keep that in mind. So as we worship together, look to him and say, Lord, please heal me from whatever is going on in my life, whether it be physical, whether it be spiritual, whether it be emotional. God, please heal me. You're the one who, as Psalm 100 says, you're the one who's healed me from all my sicknesses and my diseases. So let's all stand and worship together.
Yes, the Lord is a healer. He's the one who heals us from all our sicknesses and our diseases. We're told over in Psalm 100, verse 3, and Psalm 103, I'm sorry. Not Psalm 100, but Psalm 103, um, verse 2 and 3, that he's the one who's, who forgives us for all our iniquities and who heals us from all our sicknesses and, and our diseases. Lord, we thank you that you're a healer. We thank you that you have healed us and will continue to heal us. And we thank you for that day of ultimate healing where we'll get the redemption of our body, uh, which will be even the ultimate in the sense of healing, Father. We thank you for your love and your mercy. Let my words be yours. Let me decrease and you, you increase. God, be honored in all that's said and done here today, Lord. Let, let, let your spirit have his way. Let us realize, Lord, it's not about us, but it's about you. And about you being honored, you being lifted up, you being praised, you being exalted, not us. Help us even as we go through, our, through your word, God. As we open our Bibles, that we realize, Lord, that it's not about us, but it's all about you, Father. Let us know. Remember, let, remind us that if we do what you're told us to do, we'll be good. We'll be all right. Help us, Father, to keep our focus upon you. We thank you. Let my words be yours. Let me decrease and you increase. Lord, I pray at this time that anyone who hears my words, that they'll grow by what they've heard, Lord, that they would, they would eat it, God. It'd be good to them, Father. And well, Lord, we thank you and we love you. We pray, Lord, for uh, Miss Cassandra out front whose legs are, are hurting. We pray, Father, that you heal her, Father, you meet her at her need, Father, according to your mercy and your grace, as well as Miss Francis, who's having issues with her back, God, and, and, and not being able to move properly in her equilibrium. We pray, Father, that, that you would heal her, Father. We pray, too, Lord, for, for Josh, who's in school, and Brother Vince, Lord, who's, who's out of town. We just pray, Father, that you keep her covering upon all of them. We thank you, Daddy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We've got a lot that we'd like to cover today. And, um, I'm going to be moving pretty fast, so hopefully you all will stick with me. Remember, we have these sheets that we pass out every Sunday, and the purpose of that we, is so that you can keep along with what I'm talking about. Not only that, but we have scriptures at the beginning so that you may study, as we've shared before from 2 Timothy 2.15, that you will study or be diligent, as the New Translations put it, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman, a workwoman, need not be ashamed. What? Rightly divide the word of truth. I say this before every service, you know what I'm saying? Because we've got to dig in the word. Remember, we talked about the people in Berea, Acts 17, 11. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. They, they had a process where they just ain't take, take Paul's word for it. And that's how we got to be. Well, you just can't take my word for it. You've got to search the scriptures. Deuteronomy 32, 47 says that, that it's not a light thing. God's word is not a light thing. We've got to take this thing seriously. So y'all feeling me on this thing? So anyway, we've got a, first, a bunch of things we want to deal with today. First, we're going to do our thought of the day, our question of the day, our application of the day, and our lesson of the day. First of all, our thought of the day. Just right off bat, y'all can turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20. 1 Thessalonians 5, 20. I just want to tell you what we're going to talk about here, and that's false prophets. But there's a lot of them out here, just so y'all know this. They're all over the place. So-called in the church and out the church. We're talking to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 20. That we are to not despise prophecy. All right? Paul makes it clear that despise not prophecy. So I believe that prophecy should go on in the church today. I believe 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5, where it makes it clear that, that Paul said, I would rather have you prophesy so people could understand it in the church. So I think it's a good thing. In fact, in Acts chapter 11, we find Agabus, Acts 21. We find um, Agabus again. And not only that, but we also find that Philip had four daughters. Who prophesied? So I think that, that it is a biblical thing within the church to have prophecy, where God gives people a word. And let me just say this. It's not just, you know, we, we see prophecy like always telling the future. There is foretelling where God would give somebody a word about the future in somebody's life. But then there's also foretelling where someone just comforts through scripture about what's going to happen in the future of somebody's life. So that's kind of how prophecy works. It's not always, you know, telling the future. You know, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28 says that God put in the church, and he makes it very clear. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. He put in the church the first apostles. These are the people that be starting the church. You ever find somebody to start a church? They're apostles. Apostles. Then there's prophets. These are going to give directions for the church. And then guess what? Then there's teachers. And he mentions first, second, third. So let's just understand that. There are people who have the gift of prophecy within the church. Okay? Now, let me just say this too. There's also a bunch of false prophets. Who are running across the land. You know, my, my, my um, TV was on the other night, and it had to be like around 2 in the morning. 
and I, I woke up and we left the TV on, and there was some dude on there, a false, a well-known false prophet, bagging people for money. On my phone, somehow or another, a recording comes. Somebody, I don't know if y'all had any of y'all here that heard that had this issue. Y'all, okay, let me know how to get rid of this. This dude calls up and says, I just want to pray for you. I got a word from you. People been mean to you. I just want to pray. I got the prophets on your life and the rest of this stuff. And it's not even a person. It's a, it's a machine. Every couple of days, I had to block the number and everything. There's a bunch of false prophets out here. You know, in the, in the early church, they had something. I've talked about this in here before called the Didache or the Didache. And that document was passed around in the early church to let people know whether they would accept certain people in the church. And one of the ways that, that they, in that document, it said that if someone comes along begging for money, they're a false prophet. I remember we were at um, a brother and sister in Christ Church, and the dude and, and his wife pull up in, a, in, a, in some expensive vehicle, get out the car, come up front in the church, and, and puts his hand out and says, I've got a word of prophecy, but you got to grease my palm first. Oh my goodness. I wasn't in there when it happened. I was outside, but if I was in there, I would, I'm telling you. I think I would have went up and said, hey, look, you're crazy. There's a lot of false prophets. Not only within the church, because God says in the last days, there would be false prophets, there'd be false teachers, there'd be um, 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 antichrist. All these types are out there. All right? In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 24, in the last days, there shall be false um, Christ and false prophets and they will come along with lying signs and wonders. We need to just wake up and understand. Even if there's even within the church and outside the church. Psych, I got a niece who's involved with psychic network stuff. I, you know, I, put, I, I told her, listen, judgment come upon you. Judgment come upon you for that, unless you repent. Give your life to Christ. She's a false prophet. And guess who gets sucked in with, with stuff like this? We're told in, 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 um, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, we were talking about this on the way here, how that some people are ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You have people, and, and before that, Paul says, there, there's, there's some people just silly people laden with sin. And then they get sucked in by a false prophet. As God's people, we need to be careful. In fact, we're told in Luke chapter 6, verse, verse 36, Jesus, or verse 26, Jesus said, Woe unto you when all manner of men speak well of you, but so did they the false prophets. Whenever you find a teacher and everybody speaks well of them, you better watch out. Because maybe they really ain't right. I'm just saying. You know what I'm saying? The whole world loves them. Something ain't right. It's a whole list of them come on TV. We got to say, hey, are they right or are they wrong? Are y'all feeling me on this? Just understand this. The prophets in biblical days, Micaiah. Micaiah was hated by all the other prophets and, hate, and hated by Ahab. Remember not only uh, Micaiah, uh, remember Elisha. As he goes against all these, these prophets of Baal. He's the only one, or very, one of, of the few, because we know that there were many that God had hidden and set aside, but he was the only one making a stand. But for the most part, there was only a few of them. Remember Jeremiah, the only one going around telling the truth. I mean, so let's just understand how this thing works. If you want to call yourself a prophet, I just want to say this. Prophets suffer in scripture. Ezekiel, his wife died. God used his wife as an example. He was told not to cry. Now try that. If you want to be the prophet, not only that, but they take Jeremiah and they stone, later on, we know um, history tells us, they stoned Jeremiah to death. They cut Isaiah in two. These are the prophets of God. You know what I'm saying? That's why Jesus said, which are the prophets that you not, not put to death? So let's just understand, the last days there will be false prophets. And when we, when we hear it, one of the ways we know that we're dealing with a false prophet, maybe you go to a church where there's false prophets. They stand up and they're saying stuff for money. Jude tells us they will follow the line of Balaam. Balaam did it for money. And when you see that, just know right off the jump, just know off the jump, I'm dealing with a false prophet. And we're told, 1 Thessalonians 5.22, we're told to, that we're, to, we're to, um, to not reject prophecy, but we're to 
um, abstain from all appearances of evil, cling to that which is good, meaning if someone comes along and they, they got a prophetic word, if it's good, it lines up with the word, I'm going to take it and see if it comes to pass. But if it doesn't, then I'm going to say, you know what, something's not right here. Something's not right. So we got a lot of these false prophets. And we got them all throughout the land. And because of that, we need to watch out. Are y'all feeling me on this? I don't care who they are. I don't care who, what their name is. I remember some years ago, there was a dude named, I, I ain't even going to give his name, but he was prophet such and such. Everybody knew who he was. Growing up in a church asking for money. Let's just be God, as God's people. Let's be a little wise on this thing. Y'all with me on this thing? Somebody say amen. Amen. Anyway, let's move on. So I thought of the day, we're moving from that. Now, our question of the day. Now, this came from Shari, who I didn't think would be here today, but she did. <laughs> who was Melchizedek? Y'all can all turn over to Genesis chapter 14. Let's turn there. Genesis 14. You know what? I don't know anybody whose name is Melchizedek. Do y'all? Have y'all ever known somebody with that name? It's almost like, you know, but not Melchizedek. Man. Okay, there you go, Shaquita. Another name for the baby. Genesis 14. Look at what God says. God tells us in Genesis 14, now Abraham had just rescued Lot. And when he rescued Lot, you know, and as well as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, all of a sudden, you know, this man comes out to meet him. And in verse 18, it says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God of the Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, a possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God of the Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a, t a tenth of all. Look over in Psalm chapter 14. Psalm chapter 14. Actually, Psalm chapter 110. Psalm 110. 110. <laughs> Psalm 110. I'm moving quickly, so hopefully y'all can keep up with me. Psalm 110, look what it says in verse, uh, verse 3. And this speaks about Jesus. Your people shall be volunteers in the days of your power. Are you all there? And it says, In the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. And it says in verse 4, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And this speaks about Jesus. Let's turn quickly over to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter um, chapter 5. Now in Hebrews 5, look at what um, Paul, I think he probably wrote, may have written this, maybe even Barnabas. Look what it says here in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become a high priest, but he was, as it said of him, you are a son, today I've begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And then it talks about how Jesus in the days of his, his flesh, you know, he offered himself up with, God, with godly tears. And look what it says in verse 10. And called by God as, as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. It talks about Jesus again. How this is the order in which he came through. He didn't come through the line of Aaron. Okay. He came through the line of Melchizedek. Okay. Now, Aaron was the human priestly line, okay, which became the Levites. Look at what it says here in verse 11. Of whom we have much to say, which just speaks about Melchizedek. He says, you know, Paul says, I got a lot to say about him. He says, I got much to say and hard to explain, since, but it's going to be hard for me to explain it to you in so many words because you become dull of hearing. And then he goes on to talk about how did this church here had gotten to the point where they should have been more mature, but they needed milk instead of meat because they were not skilled and had not the experience when it came to the things of God. So he said, I can't share with you certain things I want to share with you about Melchizedek. But then guess what he does? In chapter 7, verse 1, I'm chapter 6, I'm sorry, verse 1, he talks about how that, you know, you need to be careful that you don't fall away. You need to be careful that you don't come and taste the things of God. Then all of a sudden, you know, you've been tasting, you've been partaking of the things of God. Then all of a sudden, you walk away. It becomes impossible to renew a person like that again to repentance. And then guess what he does in chapter 7? He gets back on Melchizedek again. 
And look at what he says. He says, for this Melchizedek, <laughs> you know, king, at the end of chapter 6, he talks about him, king of Salem, prince, he says, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. To him also Abraham gave a tenth of all, first being translated king of righteousness. Now remember we said before that that's what his name means, okay, king of righteousness. Now, the question has come up, who is this guy? All right? And it goes on to say here that he has no father. Look what it goes on to say. It says, and no mother. It says in verse 3, without father, without mother, this is Melchizedek, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Okay? So some have said in this situation, first of all, the Jews believe that, and have always believed, that Melchizedek was Shem. Okay? Because remember, um, Noah had three sons. Y'all remember what his sons were? Anybody remember? What was in the sons? Of? Yeah, Ham, Shem, and Jacob. Okay. Now, some believe this was Shem. Okay. This is what they told. I don't. I, there's no evidence of that. Okay. This is something they made up. You ever talk to somebody just make up something? You ever talk to, they say, "Oh yeah, you see Bob? Yeah, I saw Bob yesterday." You know? No, they didn't. You just lied. Anyway, I don't believe that that's who he is. Now, some believe. That this is no way Jesus. This is because some have pointed to this being Jesus. Some have said this can't be Jesus. Because it says that he is like, he's made like Jesus. Okay? It says he's made like the Son of God at the end of verse 3. Okay? And so they, they say well, there's no way that it could be him. Not only that, it says he has no father and mother. Jesus had a mother. But look at this. And you look at all this and you put it together. In the Old Testament, you have certain things called um, uh, theophanies and Christophanies. Anybody remember what that is? Theology, uh, theophanies are just things where Jesus, where God, the Father. Theophanies were appearances of God in the Old Testament. Many believe, which I am kind of uh, prone to believe, that almost all those appearances were really appearances of Jesus, which are called Christophanies, which are Old Testament appearances of Jesus. Many believe that Melchizedek was just an Old Testament Jesus. Jesus showing up in a different way. Okay? Because look at all this evidence. I mean, he's called it. The, notice what he's called. He's called a king and a priest. Who else is a king and a priest? You are. Did you know that? Did y'all know that? We're told in Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 that we're kings and priests. Or he's made us to be kings and priests. So you are King Durham. You know that? And Grant, you king, I mean, you, you, you priester, or priest, priest Grant. You got to wear your priestly garments, man. You got the action man shirt on. So we are these things. But listen, not only that, but he's the king of righteousness. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says he's become our righteousness. Isn't that something? Listen, not only that, but he's the, what else is he? He's the, um, the, the, the king of Salem. Okay? which means Jerusalem, which means peace. He is the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Who's called the Prince of Peace? Jesus. Not only that, but notice what he does. He brings out bread and wine. Who does that? He's taking communion. <laughs> Doesn't that remind you of who? Of Jesus with the disciples. I mean, you know, you start putting all these things together. He has no beginning. He has no end. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. We know that Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 58, Before Abraham was, I what? I am. I'm the self-existing one. I have no beginning, no end. I mean, so doesn't this sound a lot like him? Not only that, it says he has no father and mother. And what many believe this refers to, he has within the priesthood. You can trace it back to, to the tribe of Levi or back to Aaron. But you could not trace Jesus all the way back. In the sense that he has no, no human genealogy in the human sense. So many have put this together and said, maybe this is Jesus. Let me just tell you who it is. Y'all want to know who it is? I'm going to tell y'all this morning. Grant, I'm going to tell nobody. I said that. I do not know. I think that's the first time I've ever said that about a scripture. I honor. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. No, I just don't know. All I can say is it could be Jesus, or it just could be 
a dude named Melchizedek who we get to meet in heaven. Amen. They're like, hey, what's up? You're Melchizedek? Yes, I am Melchizedek. Did he have a long beard or something? Like, man, okay, I was confused. He was because Jesus over there, man, okay. Y'all wouldn't know that. <laughs> all confused up in heaven and all that. Anyway, next thing, let's move on. Our um, application of the day. And why don't we turn quickly over to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We'll start there. Okay? And um, Ecclesiastes 11. You, all, you may have sheets of Ecclesiastes 11 verse 4. God has set up certain laws. Alright? Like um, there's the law of gravity. Y'all know what that says? Anybody know? Ayana, what's the law of gravity? You know, come on, you're the big time student with the 80s. Come on, what's the, the law of gravity? Just make up something. Come on. Just tell me. There you go, girl. We're going. <laughs> Let's come down. There you go. All right. I guess that's the law of gravity. I don't know. I'm just talking. There's all kind of laws. You know, when I was helping Joshua, when he was homeschooled, teaching him, you know, I learned all kinds. Like that there was Boyle's law, there was Newton's law. There's just all type of laws they say. Okay, there's a law of, of thermodynamics, which is a three-part law. You know, heat loss and that kind of thing. So there's different laws that that are out here. Okay, that God has set up for for mankind to follow. Now, I will say this: there's certain laws that are that that people have made up. Like, you know, I was talking to somebody at my job, a receptionist, and she was like. Yeah, because if something that happened to somebody who did something to somebody else, he said, yeah, see, that's karma right there. That's karma right there. How many of y'all heard of karma? You ever heard of karma? Good. That's the teaching that, in the, I'm sure you out there, a lot of grants, so you probably heard of karma, right? This is the, te- people use that word all the time. And, and this is the teaching that, you know what, that, that if you did something to somebody else, it's coming right back to you. Yeah. Okay? Well, karma is crazy, all right? Because karma is a belief that comes from the Hindu and Buddhist system. Buddha, the same dude who left his wife and kid. And then I'm supposed to go to a Chinese restaurant and eat his food? You're crazy. <laughs> I'm just joking now. That's a joke. But Buddha did this. this they teach, and then Hinduism, it teaches that I'm going, if I'm good, see, the thought is that if you're a good person, you do well, you know, you go to the next level till you reach Nirvana and, you know, they say like if you were, you know, an ant and you do well, you, you go to the next level, you be a road check ass and after the next level you, you, you grow to, to a bee and then what's after a bee? You know, you know. They're not stupid. Foolishness. That's what, that's what karma teaches. Okay? So we don't, we believe Hebrews 9.27 is appointed unto a man once a die and then the judgment. That's crazy. Okay, so let's understand that there were laws that we were taught when we were young by my mama, okay? And my mother used to say, you know what? What what goes around what? Comes around. Y'all heard of that? Have you ever heard this, this statement? The chickens don't come home to what? To roost. Okay? That's the old, I'm going way back there, Daryl. I'm going way back. My grandmama, grandmama statement, okay? But, God has a law that's set up in Scripture. And the name of it is sowing and reaping. Whatever a man sows, that shall he what? Also reap. All right? So, let's look at some principles. Maybe, you know, eight quick principles about sowing and reaping. First of all, <coughs> when it comes to sowing and reaping, all right? You got to, Ecclesiastes 11 verse 4, you got to get out and make a decision within your mind that I'm going to do it. I'm going to sow. It says here in verse 4, He who observes the wind will not sow, but he who regards the clouds will not reap. And what that means is if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never do it. You know what I'm saying? How I many you know people who say, you know, I'm going on a diet this week. This is going to be the week. This is going to be the week I'm cutting out all sugar. I've said I'm cutting out sugar. And I'm telling you, by the end of the day, Grant, I had to have that slurpee. I had to have that ice cream from Chick-fil-A. Okay? How many of me people don't like that? And they don't, <coughs> they don't go forward with what they say they, they want to do. And this is how many of us are. 
So first of all, you got to say, if I'm going to, to be blessed by God, this is one of the avenues that God has set up for me to be blessed, is I've got to take the steps to go in that direction and do it. I've got to, as the prodigal son did, come to my senses, okay, and say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to begin to sow in the right direction. I heard people say, you know what, when I get old, that's when I'll begin to you know, get involved in ministry. When I get old, when I get some spare time, I'll pass out some tracks. Oh, when I get, you know, when, when I get my income tax, some of you heard that, that before, you know, when I get my income tax, that's when, oh yeah, that's going to be, uh, and then we never do it, you know what I'm saying? Because for many of us, okay, we, we just set back too much and we won't get out the boat. We won't get out the boat. This is why Peter was well known, because Peter got out the boat. The second thing, listen, is look in James chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. When you sow, you must sow by faith. And whatever situation you're involved in, when it comes to giving, when it comes to, to sowing into people's lives, when it comes to sowing into the life of your children, when it comes to sowing into the, to, to whatever it is, by faith, you got to believe and be patient, knowing that God saw it and that God would reward you for being faithful. Look at what we're told here in James chapter chapter 5. Look what it says in verse 7 and 8. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. And see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rains. In so many words, we've got to be patient. I'm telling you, you know what? I haven't spent a lot of time passing, a lot of time passing out tracks. Okay? Your husband gave me a lot of tracks. And he won't get rewarded for helping me or for giving me that. But I'm telling you, I passed out tracks and I passed out flies in this community about us being here. I've done these things. And I did it where the community we were at at one time. And I remember at times doing it. And, and the hard part about it, uh, Daryl, is that I've had people slam doors in my face. I've heard people tell me, get out my face. And some guy threat, guys threatened my life with a gun. And I'm telling you, at times I said, you know, I have felt like, you know what, man, forget this. I got eternal life, but, you know. But that's how I feel. And at times I got to say, I'm not to walk by feelings. I'm to walk by what? Faith, knowing that God saw what I did and that he will eventually reward me. So I'm going to patiently, by faith, continue to obey God. And continue to sow in this situation, knowing that God has seen it and he's heard it and he will help me in this situation. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1.12, in 2 Timothy 1.12, he says, Paul says, I am fully persuaded that that which I have committed to him, he will also keep. I'm fully persuaded of that. We got to get to the point where our mind turns that corner where we say, I am not just, but I am fully persuaded. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Those that come to God must believe that he is and a reward of those who diligently seek him. I am going to believe God that if I constantly do this, you're going to reward me. It may not be here, it may not be now, it may be, you know, in the life to come, but I'm going to be rewarded. So you've got to patiently believe this by faith. And this means, you know, and if you do this, I'm telling you, you will water your seed. And you know how you water your seed? I mean, you know, you can put seed out all you want, unless you water it, it ain't going to grow. But as you, as you water your seed, you know how you do it? By, by prayer. By spending time in prayer. Praying over each situation. You know, I see my brother. I love my brother. He's my older brother. He asked me to do a resume and stuff for him, and I did it, you know, all this stuff. And you know what, you know, I, he's got this way of saying, you know, well, you know, like I'll, I'll say, man, hey, man, I appreciate it, man. I'll tell him I'm thank you, so man, no problem, you know. I, I did it for him, you know, <laughs> man, you know, people like that. But I love him. And I talk to him on the phone, and you know what my desire is? I'm investing in him. I see that as I'm trying to plant seeds, Father. And I'm believing that your word won't return void. That it will go forth and accomplish his purposes in his life. See, to me, that is sowing. Okay? We are to take the time to sow. When you give, you are sowing. When you we got a box here that you can give. We ain't nobody putting none in your face like five, six times. But we give you an opportunity to give. It's a chance to sow seed so that God can bless you. And y'all feel him in this. And then many of us, let me say this, we looking to be looking for seed, we're looking for growth, we're looking for, for a harvest, and we ain't never planted no seed. You know what I mean? 
Oh Lord, I want this and that. Well, have you ever planted a seed? God has sown and reaping principles. You might say amen. Another principle is you listen, you may reap what others have sown. Look over in John chapter um, 4. In John chapter 4. In John chapter 4. Look at what Jesus tells us. Now Jesus has been out sharing the word of God with these people in Samaria. Then he gets the disciples and calls them over and now they get the opportunity to go share the word with these guys and lead them to Christ. And he said to them in John chapter 4, in verse 37 I'll start, and the Father himself has sent me, has testified, I'm sorry, in chapter 5, chapter 4, look what it says in verse 38, I'll start in verse 38. It says, he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this saying it is true, one sows and another reaps. He said, I sent you to reap that which you have not labored. Others have labored and you've entered into their labors. And so sometimes, guess what? Others will go out and they'll, they'll put down the seed and we'll get blessed by it. Are y'all feeling me on this? Good example is, you know, I, I've heard a pastor say one time, I work hard. I built this church. I said to myself, really? Your daddy was the one who started that church. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes we are reaping the benefits of others. You know, we were in our other location. We had a, um, we had a guy who had a church. I knew a guy who had a church. And I just, I knew he had a church out in Waldorf, but I didn't know where it was at. He, I knew he went to, um, he had gone to Dallas Seminary and he knew Maurice. And so Maurice kept telling me he had a church out there. I didn't hear anything about it. And then some, one day somebody came to me and told me that the church, his church had either moved or closed down. And I said, wow, okay. And her name was Brittany. And Brittany said, I went to that church. I said, really? She said, I'm here now. And now I was benefiting from what God had done through him in her life. You know, lots of times we benefit from others, don't we? Others who've sown seed. And now we get to benefit from it. Are y'all with me on this? Does this make sense? You know, it reminds me of, in a bad way too, that happened. Um, if you grew up in a household where, where, where your family on crack or something like that, or you, I grew up without a dad, okay? So there were certain things that I missed out on. But this was a decision that my mom and dad made. So I had to reap the fruit of the decision that was sown. Are y'all with me on this? Sometimes the fourth thing is that your sin will cause you to have crop failure. You may sow into a situation, but your sin will cause crop failure. Now let me say this in the Old Testament, in the book of Joel. In fact, I'm going to turn to Jeremiah 12, verse 13. Jeremiah 12, 13. In the Old Testament, in the book of Joel, they were having problems. They were afraid because they would plant crop, and all of a sudden they would get these particular locusts. Or y'all can turn to Joel if you want. They would get these locusts, and these locusts would come and attack them. They're crop. And they were different types. There was the swarming locusts, the crawling locusts, the hopping locusts, and the, the, the destroying locusts. These were types of locusts that would come and destroy whenever they would plant stuff. And so they wouldn't have anything that would come up from what they had planted. Now, we don't harvest today. We don't live in an agrarian society. But... We plant in, in other people's lives. We plant when it comes to the word of God. We do things like that. And sometimes we look at the situation, and I'm telling you, you've got to obey God in order to really reap from the seed that you've planted. We're told in Malachi 3, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, or verse 11, God had told his people, he said, you know what? If you obey me, I will rebuke the devourer. I don't know how many times I've come home or got a phone call from Lisa, and she said, oh, well, guess what? The devourer struck. So what are you talking about? The washing machine broke. The, the, the whatever broke. And I used to say, stop saying that. Because that's the who that's to irritate me. But let me just say this. Sometimes, Jeremiah chapter 12, sometimes in our lives, there's crop failure. Look what it says here in Jeremiah 12, verse 13. God had told us, they were hard headed. He says, they have sown wheat, but they are reaping thorns. Okay? 
that have sown wheat and now they're weeping thorns. Jeremiah 5, 25 says at times, guess what will happen when you're not obedient to God? It says your iniquities have turned these good things away from you and your sin has repelled good things from you. That's Jeremiah 5, 25. I don't know how many times I planted something and then walked out there and a couple months later and like, what, what is that? I didn't plant that. Grass out there, that's weed. Are y'all with me on that? Next thing I want to point out. I'm going to make this real quick. You always reap more than what you sow. Hosea 8.7. Hosea 8.7 says if you sow to the wind, you will reap the what? Whirlwind. You'll get that tornado right back. Are y'all with me on that? So we got to be careful. Like if you plant grass seed, you ever notice more seed grows from that seed. The wind takes some of it in certain places. It's the same way when it comes to the principles of God. If you reap evil, and especially evil, more evil will come your way. That's, that's just how God has set it up. And we're going to see this today in a few minutes with the Amalekites. God has set it up like that. I remember um, this thing with uh, Saddam Hussein. When Saddam Hussein was in charge in Iraq, when he took over, um, Lisa, he had all the, the, the government officials meet in this great big auditorium. And he sat there with a cigar, and he had a list of people who he didn't like. And he called them forward, one by one, and said, you're a traitor. Took them out back, had them taken out back, and shot to death. He's sitting there smoking his cigar. People nervous, doors locked, they couldn't leave. And then when his turn came, was it 2003? When his turn came, He's in there talking about, you can't kill another Muslim. You can't do this. It's just wrong. Please. I think about Idi Amin. You heard of Idi Amin? The one who used to kill, kill and eat people? He had all his friends over his house. These people were his friends. and who, They were all together. And they were having a party and the rest of this. And they knew he was evil, but they wouldn't say nothing to him. Idi Amin's having a good They all having a so-called good time. And Idi Amin goes in the back and says, I want you all to know something. You are my friends and I love you all. And he comes back with a, somebody's head in his hand and says, this was what happens to people I do not like. A couple of months later, almost everybody in our room was dead. You know, because they didn't open their mouth and say something. When you see people on TV who take people's lives, kill people, you know, you ever watch the news, such and such shot and kill such, believe me, they're dead coming, okay? We're going to see this in a second. And it's going to be probably worse and sometimes you sow in tears. Look in Psalm 126, verse 5. How many of us sow into a situation crying? You may sow in tears, but you will reap, it says here, you will reap in joy. How many of us sow into a situation? You don't spend time in that situation. You don't spend money into that person's life. Maybe your children's like, now all of a sudden they're cutting a fool. You don't try hard to pour into their life. And it's been a very tearful event. You know, it's funny, as I, not too long ago, I was looking at, up tears, and you know, they say when it comes to tears, there's different types of tears. Did you know that, Ayana? There's like two to three different types of tears. There's a tear that you get when you yawn. How many you yawn? How many sleepy? Okay, when you yawn, that type of tear is different than the tear that comes when you're sad. The tear that comes when you're sad is made up of different chemicals. And that particular, or happy, and those particular chemicals, they say, have a healing process in it that help you to relieve stress. Isn't that something? Just remind you, Revelation 21 verse 4 says that the day will come when God will wipe away what? Hmm? And you hear, how do you know that? It doesn't just say our tears, but every tear, man. You know, Psalm 56 verse 8 says he takes our tears and puts them in a bottle. You know, people, they said professional mourners used to catch people's tears, put them in bottles, put them on top of the, the mantle. And they would keep them there, Grant, to just remind them of that sad time. Well, God takes our tears and he puts them in a bottle. He writes our name, it goes on to say, in his book. But it's just amazing that he's going to get that close to you, um, sir, and he's going to take his hand and do like this, sir. They may have a magic hand where he just gets everybody at one time, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, he just got 10, million, 10 billion people. Wow, that was cool. But sometimes, you know, we sow with tears, don't we? But just know God saw it, and you will reap in joy one day. And we don't reap in the same season that we sow. <clears throat> Haven't you seen miracle grow? They put miracle growing stuff, and the stuff just grows like that. Then they say it don't last long. 
If you sow, okay, some of you like, I gave, I gave $10, Lord. By this time, this evening, I need $25. I knew a brother in Christ who used to come to church and he would give, <laughs> bless his heart, he would give, I would bring him to church, he would give all the money in his pocket. And then as I was taking him home, he said, Pastor, you need to loan me $10. <laughs> I'm like, hey, okay, all right. He said, Master, well, didn't you have somebody? No, I gave it all today, Pastor. You think you're... <laughs> it was just, it was cool, but it was crazy. I don't know. But we want to reap in the same season. It takes time for seed to grow. Now, with me on that. Now, if you're young in the Lord, the Lord may give you a quick turnaround thing, you know. But for the most part, as you grow, God says, you know what? Remember the children of Israel, when they came up out of Egypt, I'm sure, they had manna every day. You remember that? For 40 years. And then the, the Bible says the day came when the manna ceased. And guess what they ate? Anybody remember? Corn. It took corn. They had to put it in the ground and wait for it to come up. And believe God to watch over the crop. The last thing I want to say about this, and that's it, Galatians 6. Why don't we turn to Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And then we'll just go a couple of minutes in a second. Galatians 6, verse 9. It says, Do not grow weary in well doing, for you shall reap in due season if you faint not. Are y'all with me on this? In so many words, don't give up. Don't give up on obeying God. He's seen your situation. He knows what you're going through. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Listen, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your labor is not in vain. And y'all wouldn't understand. How many of you ever felt like, you know, I've done this, I've been praying about this. You know, I know some people said to me, you know, I tried Jesus. I prayed. It ain't work, you know. Well, maybe you really didn't dig deep. Maybe you didn't seek him with your whole heart. Don't give up. Because there is a season, a due season, in which you shall reap. If you faint not. And y'all with me on this? You don't know when that season might be. Y'all planning these kids' life. You know what I mean? That day gonna come when one of them turn around and just say, you know what? I love you. I said, just thank you. You brought me up from Jesus. And you're gonna be like, it was all worth it. You know what I mean? Many of us right now just just waiting for the harvest. God says, just be patient. And don't grow weary. He'll bless you in due season when the time is right. I heard a story before about a man who, who broke, who was trying to break out of jail, and he used a spoon. And he'd dug under there for years, and finally he got to a point where he said, this stuff ain't working. It's just not working. And he had dug, 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 and found a young girl. He said, I quit. He gave up. But later on, they did an investigation and found out that he was six inches away from the top of the surface. Now with me on that. Don't give up. You will reap in that proper season if you just be patient and let God. I want to deal with this today. One last thing. We got five minutes left. Let's turn to First Samuel. First Samuel 15. We're gonna go ten minutes, is that all right? First Samuel 15. And I'll start in verse 1. Now, as we saw before at this time, Saul is king. Samuel's the prophet. Saul has been hard-headed, but God's going to give him another chance. Let me have a mess up. And God says, okay, I love you. Let's try this thing over. Let's get a reboot. You ever, re um, um, Grant, you ever played a game and you were just down by so much, you just said, man, look, I'm pushing the button down. You ever been online and played somebody and they pushed the button, you know what I mean? I used to play basketball online years ago. People push the button. That's to make you so mad, you know. But you get a God gives you a reboot. Okay. God gives Saul another chance. He's king. So look what happens in verse one. And so, so Samuel also said to, to Saul, "The Lord has sent me to anoint you king over all of His people." Wow. He lets him know right up front. Obey God. Now, one of the things you understand is we obey God. We told in John chapter 14, verse 15, if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. We obey him out of love. But not only that, but God wants us to obey him out of the position that we have. You're a child, I honor the most high God. If some dude gets you, he done won the lottery. You with me on that? 
He done won the lottery when you get married. Well, Michael, one of you little guys, when the time comes when y'all get married, she has got herself a king. You are a king. Understand your position in Christ. And so look what he says. You have been chosen. God chose us before the foundations of the world. He said to him, Samuel. Samuel said to him, Saul, listen. The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. And what he's saying is, listen. Don't just listen, but obey. <laughs> Y'all with me on that? <laughs> obey the voice. This is the voice of God is what he's saying. Look at what he said. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. The word Lord of hosts means the God of armies. You know, God will fight our battles, won't he? He's right now working behind the scenes, fighting for you. You know, there's a song by Brian Courtney Wilson who talks about how he fights for us. He will fight for you. You know, in Exodus 15, verse 3, is it, um, is it, um, Miriam, who stands up and says, the Lord our God is a warrior. He is a warrior. And he will fight our battles. And so look at what it says here in verse 2. The Lord of hosts says, I will punish the Amalekite for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up out of Egypt. Wow. <laughs> to me, when I read that for the first time, I thought, that just blew my mind. I'm like, wow. Now that had happened hundreds of years ago. And God said, hey, I remember. I haven't forgot. I ain't forgot what they did to you, Shaquita. God said, I ain't forgot that. I ain't forgot what they did to you, Sheriff. I ain't forgot. God says he hasn't forgotten, Lisa, what they did to you. God sees that. And look at what he says. I'm going, to I'm going to deal with these people for what they did. You know, it reminds me of Romans 12, verse 19, where God says, the vengeance is mine, I will repay. I will repay. You know what's interesting? Turn to Deuteronomy 25. This is going to be our last passage of the day. Deuteronomy 25. I'll wait for you all to get there, verse 17. And we'll see why God was so mad at these people for what they did. And God says, I'm going to deal with them. Because when the children of Israel came up out of Egypt, when they all came out, you know, you got... You know, probably 8 million people coming up out of Egypt. And as they're coming out, they had never fought anybody. They didn't know how to fight. They didn't know anything about war. God took them along a route where they would avoid war and confrontation with others and stuff like that. But guess who attacked them, man? Look what it says here in verse 17. Remember what Amalekite, what the Amalekite did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt. How he met you on the way and attacked your rear rank. All the stragglers in your rear, when you were tired and weary, and he did not fear God. God said, I ain't forgot that. When they said this about you, when they did that to you, and he attacked you when you were tired, he said, therefore, I want you to wipe all of them out. I want you to wipe all of them out. And this is why we to pray for our enemies. <laughs> you know that? Turn back to first Samuel. God says, you know what? Because of what they did, I want them all wiped out. And I've heard people say, well, well it's not, not right that God killed everybody. Who are you? Who am I to question Almighty God? I was talking to somebody not too long ago, and they said, I said, well, let me ask you something. They didn't believe in Jesus. They said, where'd you get all these opinions about this and that? They said, well, this is what I think. I said, am I supposed to believe what you think or what the Apostle Paul taught in the Word? You were Paul. Who? Who are we to question God? All souls, God says in Ezekiel, all souls are mine. This is why he could do what he wanted in Genesis chapter 6. He wipes out the whole earth, okay? Except for Noah and his family. So he says, I want you to wipe them all out. Children, animals, all of them. And I believe, we talked about this in here before, mercy killing. Well, the Lord in his mercy will have children put to death. I believe that. Because he knows that when they get old, they will reject him. So now they can come to heaven, they're under the age of accountability, they'll go be with him. But if they get old and continue in that system, their lives will be screwed up. And God said kill them all, you know why? Because let me just say this, they have found, they've done research, that there were these, these, these environments were rampant with sexual disease mainly sexual disease believe it or not they're worshiping other gods and god says 
If you marry these people, there'll be a thorn in your side and a prick in your eye. Don't, girl, marry no unbeliever. I don't care how pretty she is, girl. That's what they will be. God said, wipe them out. Stay away from them. So anyway, last verse and we'll close off. He said, kill both men, women, infant, nursing, child, ox, sheep, camel, donkey. And so Saul gathered all the people together. He had, you know, 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Malachi and lay hold and wait in the valley. And verse 6 says, Then Saul said to the Canaanites, or the Canaanites, these are the Canaanites, not the Canaanites, but the Canaanites, Go depart, get down from among the Malachites, lest I destroy you with them, for I show kindness. He says, For you show kindness to all the children of Israel, and they came up out of Egypt. Wow. He's giving them a chance to get away from the situation. Let me say this. I remember when I was small and my mother would beat, give my brother a beating. See, we didn't call our, our when we were small, they didn't call it spankings or they didn't even call it whoopings, they just call it beatings. You know what I'm saying? And they would beat my, my brother for being hard-headed. And I'm telling you, if I was anywhere near where my mother had that belt, guess what? I'd get a little of it too. You know what I'm saying? So I'd get away from it. And what he's saying, what God is saying, is the Canaanite, the Canaanite, the Canaanite, Get back, bro. Y'all got nothing to do with this. Y'all were good to us. In fact, Moses married a, a, a Canaanite in some translations of this says. Now, Chris, y'all were a Canaanite. I guess that was a Canaanite with which he had, had married. But anyway, that's a different story. But these were good people, and they were just living out there near the Amalekites. And he said, man, back up. How many of you know people get involved in things they shouldn't get involved with? And so he said, get back. And so guess what he does? We'll look at it next time. He, he goes and he, he, he wipes out all the people, but he keeps some of them. He keeps one mainly. He keeps the sheep and all the rest of this stuff. And we're going to see later that Saul, then he makes a statue to himself. Saul was self-consumed and Saul was self-willed. Have you ever talked to somebody and you say to them, this is what God's word says, period. And they say, I know, but I think, I feel. Back away. Because guess what? You're dealing with someone who's exactly like Saul. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time that we had today. We covered a whole lot. We pray, Father, that the things we learn and go a long, long way in our lives as your people. We pray you bless us as we leave here. Bless us in our coming in and our going. We thank you for your mercy and your love. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Just let me point out some things we learned today. Watch out for false prophets. Okay? Now we have cell phones. Like I said, I got one calling my cell phone. Watch out for that. Remember we said not only false prophets, but there'll be false Christ, there'll be false, false teachers, okay? Be careful, all right? As God's people stick close to the word, we're to examine all things based upon scripture, not based upon what someone may say, but based upon the word of God. Read 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 through 23, and you'll, you'll understand the context. Remember we saw who Melchizedek was. We're not sure. We just know he was greater than Abraham, all right? And we do know that he was someone who was chosen by God. He was a priest and a king of the Most High God. Okay? Amen? Um, not only that, but we also saw sowing and reaping principles. Let's start sowing into good things. Okay, maybe you made some mistakes in the past. Now you can start today by sowing some good seed. Okay, maybe your attitude can change about the way you are. Maybe you can start, you know, say, okay, today's going to be a new day. I'm going to start sowing when it comes to giving. We got a box around here somewhere. Maybe today's going to be the day I'm going to sow when it comes to, so let's say, reading my word. Today I'm going to start this process. Okay? Today I'm going to start a new chapter in my life. And I'm going to start sowing and reaping good seed. Amen? Not only that, but we saw uh, in the life of, of Saul, how to Saul, you know, he started out well, but he just was hard-headed. We saw, we looked at mercy killing. Remember that? And remember we just saw that sometimes it's best that God takes some people home. Remember we saw also how that God will fight our battle. Don't be afraid. He'll fight for you. He's a big God. He's a big God. And woe unto anyone who messes with the people of God. Because he will not forget it. He will not forget. This is, I'm talking about, this is a long time later. 
And God says, I remember what they did. Amen? Any questions before we close off? Amen. All right. Got a song here at the end of God, I give you my heart by asking the evidence. Um, Miss Joy, can you tell us to have a good day at the end? Is that okay? Can we all stand and worship? May the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face to shine upon you, give you peace, give you a great week in Jesus. Amen. Amen.
the Lord. Uh, we just thank God for his word today and what he's sown in our hearts and let us all go out this week and be fruit bearers to what he has taught us in this in, in here today. God bless you all. Have a good week. <laughs>